I propose that we that we continue with this presentation. So now we are going to presentation number one, uh, geographic information systems. What do we mean with it? An information system, and it's also a technology. I will come back to that. Also a bit strange. Okay, here. Okay. Uh, for those of you who cannot follow the live stream, I noticed that the recording is working well. Let me check. Yes, okay, it's working. It's recording it. So if you want to have the images together with it, you can uh, you can watch the recording afterwards. Of course, it's not ideal if the live stream isn't working, but maybe try to to turn off your computer and 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 uh, open the link again because the link is correct. And on my computer, it appears that it's it that it has started. I can see on some other computers that it's working as well. So I don't know where the problem is. Probably not with the connection. Maybe it's some setting in in on your computer or, or your browser. Um, but don't panic, the recording will be okay. Of course, when I say such things, the recording will also break, but no, we, we have faith in, in this technology. So let's proceed with the, first, with the first presentation. So this is a presentation I will be giving you today. As I mentioned, it's not really representative or the way we do it, it's not representative for the rest of the course because the rest of the presentations we will be working with recordings. I think that's that's clear. But anyway, I think it's good that we do this session together simultaneously, either on campus or, or through the live stream, so that you know about the language that we are talking when we when we refer to GIS. Does anyone any one of you already have some experience in GIS? Yes, and also in the software or Okay. Uh, I only understand that you are u utilizing. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a mouth mask. I, I yeah, don't. Oh. Ah, okay. Um. Ah, yeah, okay. And which software did you use? Was it uh, QGIS? Yeah. That's one of the most uh, used open source software. That's also the software that you will use in these practicals. Because it's a, it's a benefit that it's open source, you don't have to pay. There is this alternative, ArcGIS. Maybe anyone else has, has experience with ArcGIS? Yes, okay. Um, that's that's a paid software. You students can have a student license for 10 euros. Um, but we chose to work with QGIS in the, in our practical sessions because you can, there's, there are other benefits. You can use it offline, you don't need this, this license, you can work with it offline. And also another important uh, advantage I discovered throughout the year, uh, last year, you can use it on Mac, on, on Apple computers. RGIS is very hard, they're not really good friends, I think, Esri and, and Apple. But with QGIS, you can use it. So it's good that you already have some experience, you may know some of the concepts that we are talking about, but this session today is really meant as an introduction to GIS. What do we mean? What, what is it all about? What do we want you to know or to be able of after this, uh, after this course? So I will also ask you a lot of questions. Uh, what do you see? There are no wrong answers here. Yes? Yes, you are already interpreting uh, data yeah, because you can see, you can indeed see data representing uh, Spain and also Portugal. And this is what I wanted to show you. There is a difference between data and information. Uh, data is is just in this case an image. You can you can see uh, red colors, uh, dark linear structures, for example, here. And if you interpret this data, you will you will see that these dark linear structures are probably probably representing rivers, right? or this this whole territory is representing Spain and and Portugal. And this is an image um, collected by a satellite, which can be orbiting around 600 or 700 kilometers above the Earth's surface, and it's collecting data. And you can see that this is. 
sensed or measured at high uh, altitudes, so the resolution is low, or the amount of detail that you can retrieve from this image is rather low. It's impossible to see buildings, for example, houses, people, and so on. This is an image describing the world as it was or is. We'll come back to that later. Why is it important? Because that's what, what spatial planners need as an input to make their decisions. And we will come back to this later. GIS or geographical information systems is a system or is a technology that will be able or will be helping you to provide answers, to, to answer questions by creating information and by, in the end, supporting decisions. And so this is the world as it was or is, because also here, this data is collected with a timestamp. It's valid for a certain moment in time. And this is a rep representation of the reality. And of course, reality is something dynamic. It's something that changes throughout the time. This is a static image. And so you can see this can still be true at this moment, but it can also have changed. And so it is representing the world as it was or is, because it can also, it can also have stayed the same throughout the years. This is another, another image collected by a helicopter, or these days could also be perfectly collected by, by a drone. Uh, UAVs are a very important source of, of such, uh, such imagery. And what can you see here? What can you, which information can you retrieve from such, uh, such an image? Which elements of the reality can you see? Can you collect from this, uh, this image? I think it's obvious here. Houses, buildings, is very clear, yes? Yes, yes. So in the end, actually what you can also see is height of objects, height of buildings, you can see, but also the elevation of your landscape. Uh, these parcels or, or areas will be lower in altitude because they are flooded compared to this, this area. Uh, so the more you zoom in or the lower you will gather your information, the higher the resolution. And the resolution will, will uh, increase. So here it is possible to distinguish buildings from their surroundings. Individual trees can even be, can even be um, um, discovered. Again, if you zoom, zoom in more or you collect your data at a, at a lower uh, altitude, the amount of detail that you will be able to see and to um, distillate from this image will also increase. Here you can see people, you can even see accidents, and the more you zoom in, you can even find probably the cause of such an, uh, such an accident. Uh, so the lower you get, the higher your resolution will be. All these images representing the world as it was or is. A world, you have to look at it as the reality, because we will make a distinguishment between what we will be using in GIS, eh, objects and, 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 and so on, representing some parts of reality. And we're always interested in the geographic reality. That, that so previously was the world as, as it was or is. You can also make similar uh, maps or models of the wor world as we want it to be. Eh? These are typically not represented by maps or, or visualized by maps, but, but rather other, other models or sketches. Eh? This can be um, or, or a plan uh, of a city, how we want to develop it, uh, which parts of the city, which areas we can designate to, to industry. We can use that to, as industry parks. Other zones can be used for, for housing, for, uh, for buildings. Other zones for recreation, for example, parks or water bodies. That's how we represent the world as we want it to be. And so. A very simplistic view, uh, GIS, I already mentioned it. We will try to come with answers to certain problems, and often these problems uh, result from spatial planning issues. Uh, and as spatial planners, you, for example, when you, when you finish your career here and you end up at a certain municipality or, or at, the, at the government, and you will be working as spatial planners, you will be interested in four different parts. So it's a very simplistic view. It's the, world, the real world as it is. As the first one, the real world as it was. And of course, you will be interested in, in finding the difference bet differences between it and the factors causing this transition from the world as it was to the world as it is. 
and you can use this information, this, these trends, to predict the world as it will be under a certain uh, projected, projected scenario, which can be the BOW scenario. Do you know what BOW is the acronym for? It's uh, business as usual. And what if we just keep on doing what we, what we are doing? For example, um, taking into account the deforestation rate that can be an example. And you can predict the world as it will be. And lastly, very importantly, the one we saw on the previous slide, the world as we want it to be. And so how do we want to plan our future? How should it look like? And then also here, between three and four, try to minimize this difference between the world as we want it to be and the world as it will be if we do not act uh, or if we do act under a certain uh, scenario. Uh, that's what we what we try to minimize. Uh, so this information about this transition is important, but also it's important to know where you're heading to uh, because you're spatial planners, you have to think at the long term and also at the, at the short term. So you have to try to look at the future. Uh, so di there are different instruments to, to model this or to visualize it. Maps are, tr are the traditional instruments to describe the world as it was or is. So the situation of today, you can uh, represent it by a map. Char typical characteristics of a map, it will give you an overhead perspective, top-down perspective, you will look down. Uh, two dimensions, uh, so it's a planimetric uh, scale. Of course, you can also represent the third dimension on it, but you will need to, to make some kind of arrangement. And it's scaled, uh, very important. For example, a scale of 1 to 25,000, meaning that one centimeter on your map represents 25,000 centimeters on your in, in reality. So this is a, the equivalent of 250 meters in reality. So it's important that you ha add this scale. Uh, also, when you're doing your practical sessions, you're preparing your assignments, you're making maps at a scale, at a scale bar. That's very, very important. That's an easy, easy point that you can, can uh, um, collect. Broadly, there are three different types of maps. You have the topographic uh, base maps. In Dutch, it's a Stafkaart. It's a very good reference map. It will give you an idea about all the elements that you see when you're standing on, uh, on at the ground level, uh, buildings, vegetated areas, and, and so on. So that's your topo topographic map, often used as a base map for other maps. Uh, so thematic maps, they can be very detailed in, in one team. Uh, for example, if you have um, a map of all the forests in, in Flanders. This can give you information about which species are there, uh, the age of, of, your, of your forest, for example, or if it's an agricultural parcel map, which crops are, are used, what is the crop rotation, um, and so on. So these are thematic maps, often put on top of such topographic maps or, or other reference maps, and these fo photo maps as well. Uh, these are the typical uh, aerial photographs, uh, Luchtfotos, also containing a lot of uh, useful information. Oh, these are different types of, time, uh, types of maps. This is an example of the topographic map of, of the region near Couture uh, Saint-Germain. It has a cartographic scale of 1 to 50,000, meaning that one centimeter on your map represents how many meters in reality? Let's check if, you, if you're still awake. 500, indeed. What's the danger? with representing a scale like this. If I would have this map as a printout, take it with me in the, in the field, yes? yes but that's with every, every scale, but you're right. We'll also t come back to this if we're, if we're dealing with Geographic information systems, this data, this database is very important. If you have errors in it, you, will, you must be uh, aware that also your answers that you will get will contain errors. Other problems, if maybe if I print it, it's not really a good example. If I use it, imagine I have uh, a tablet. I will, I will add this map, so this image, here on my, on my tablet. Take it with me in the terrain. I will come near a place, uh, for example, uh, a water body represented here, and I will start zooming in. What will happen? Indeed, indeed, I will, I will, I will manipulate 
my map, so, so this scale, one centimeter that I see when I zoom in will not represent 500 uh, meters uh, in reality. So therefore, if you use a scale bar, uh, you will have seen it, uh, I'm, I'm very sure, this, this pro problem will not arise because also your scale bar will be, will be manipulated similarly as your map. So that's a topographic uh, base map. This is an example of aerial photography and you can still see that you can get a lot of useful information in it uh, from it. And you can see buildings, uh, cars here, a railway network. This will give you information that if you're standing in, in, the, in the field, it's, it will not always be possible to see all these details as some can be, um, uh, how do we have to phrase it? will not be visible from the from the ground because for example there is a hatched or it's private area you cannot you cannot access it you can even see the crowns of of trees on your image and so also here a lot of useful information can be can be retrieved that's with regards to the maps if we look at or if we want to describe the world as we want it to be well most often not use maps or not use maps only uh, also at other uh, sources or other representation ways, such as plans and, and sketches. And if you look here, this can be a plan of, of, a, of a certain neighborhood you want to check, or you want to, if you want to develop it, you can, you can attribute these zones for building a house, but also um, keep enough, enough room to um, develop gardens or to develop urban green in an area, for example or recreation, recreation parks, uh, sports fields. That's how we, how we, how we come with, with this. But also here, you must have uh, a scale mentioning how you look at reality. That's a 2D uh, approach. So this was a 2D approach. This is, you can also make sketches and, and, uh, and other tools in 3D. Uh, again, look at the scale, look at the resolution. This has a very high resolution. This can be used for interior design. You can also create sketches, but you can make similar maps at landscape level. Uh, try to, to um, estimate or to, to catch the, the 3D dimension, the elevation in a certain landscape, and, and also at city levels include heights of buildings and so on. So also these tools are present or can be used to um, Represent, represent reality as you want it to be. And so here, uh, I think I, I discussed uh, most of it. And so maps, sketches, and plans, all these tools that we, that we saw are simplified models. And so think again, we have reality and we want to model it. And that's what we will do in, in, in GIS. But how do we model it? Well, we of course, we'll have to simplify or to create some kind of representation and very important, you, we will simplify it indeed. It's a simplified representation, but the way or, or the, the, the methods you use to simplify, the assumptions you make to simplify will depend, of course, on your objective, on the questions that you want to answer. If you're interested in, in finding the, the species composition of a certain forest, you will, it, it might be, be possible to very uh, roughly estimate the, the buildings that are present or all the other landscape elements and we'll talk about entities in a few in a few minutes all the other entities while our forests we will have to um, estimate them or map them very accurately very detailedly and so again this is an abstract representation of the reality of the ge geographic reality in 2d or two or a 3d space it will display the location and shape of entities which occur in geographic reality I will give the definition of an entity already now, but because it's very important in the story. An entity, we will look at it as a part of reality with clear boundaries. So a crisp object. A crisp meaning that it has clear boundaries. Uh, if you think again about the images that I showed you before, buildings have clear boundaries. Uh, it's very clear to say, uh, here I'm standing in a building, there I'm outside the building. There the building stops. Uh, that's reality is composed of different entities. I'm already making a mistake on purpose now, but we'll come back to that later. But that's not really a mistake. I'm not um, complete. My answer is not complete. Reality will consist of more than entities, but I will come back to that later. But know that these entities are there 
And of course, we're talking about geo-information, geographical information systems. Each entity will have a certain location in, in, uh, on, the, uh, on the globe and a certain shape. And we'll also come back to that later. They are scaled and they will allow you to do measurements on distances, areas, height, height differences and so on. And for example, a building, you can easily cal compute the height of a building, the height of a tree, um, the area of an agricultural parcel, for example, uh, the area of a, of a water body. So you can compute these or measure these um, parameters on your map or on your sketch or on, on your plan. This is what I already mentioned. It describes the state of reality at a specific moment in time, meaning that they are static. And so it's a snapshot, it's one moment in time, which cannot really uh, coincide with reality because you know that reality changes. E either, the, well, the location can also change if it's a dynamic object. If you're interested in, in mapping the pattern of wild boars or, or, or other animals, for example, or people. Right? So you can also do that with, uh, with GIS tools. You know that your location can be um, dynamic, even your shape can change. For example, if it's a, if it's a tree, it can, it can grow. If it's an agricultural parcel, it can extend, it can, it can incorporate other fields. Or if it's a building, you can also adapt your building, make it higher or make it uh, wider if you, if you do some reconstruction. So even the shape can change. And other characteristics as well, I will come back to that later. Of course, there is a legend, I already talked about scale, this information content is positively related to the scale. And so the, um, the more detail you see will also, the, the amount of detail you see will also depend on, on your scale. I think it's logic. And similarly, the extent of your represented zone is quadratically inversely proportional to the scale. And because you're working in two dimensions, it's, it's quadratically. If you zoom out, you can, you can map or you can cover a larger territory than, than when you zoom in. Okay. Is this clear so far? Any questions on the, from the live streaming audience? I'm not sure if there is a, a time difference between the live stream and not. Okay, so questions may appear. You can just um, inform me. So maps, sketches, and plans are more the traditional ways, are often analog or only present in an analog way, meaning that they are printed, they're not digitized yet. Whereas the, the center part in, um, I, will, I will come back to, I, I will immediately um, let you see this slide. For geographic, information systems and have actually every information system it doesn't need to be geographic reference information system it can also be the KU Loquette for example or your bank account all also they also work with a with a, an information system and very central in this information system is the database and that's that's one of the of the key uh, elements of an information system and this database will contain information about your entities. So the first step when you, when you start with an information system or to build your information system or your database yourself is to collect data. And this can mean that, for example, in your master thesis, you can go out into the field with, some, uh, with a GPS device and measure locations yourself. Right? And that way you're, you're collecting your data yourself. It can also mean that you will use existing data. Right? You can just add it to your database. If these existing data are only present in an analog way, you will have to digitize them first. I will also come back in, in one of the next sessions how you do this. And there are certain tools for it because we often forget it, but there, still, there is still some very useful information present only on, in an analog format, uh, only on printed maps. For example, old land use maps are not often digitized, so you will have to digitize it yourself. If you're interested in finding out the trends or the changes throughout time, it can be necessary to first, that you will first have to digitize this information. So you will collect data about these entities. Entities, remember the definition, it's a crisp object. It has clear boundaries. Example, examples of these entities are persons, associations, companies, invoices, and so on, municipalities, 
uh, agricultural parcels, forest patches, and so on, they all have a clear boundary. You will have to collect data on these entities. Uh, what kind of data can you, can you collect? For example, if it's a person, I can collect data about their name, their national number, their age, their date of birth, and so on. So if it's a, another example, if it's a parcel, it can be the ca cadastral identification number. Who is the owner? Also for buildings, who is the owner? What is the value? When was this, this parcel sold previously? What are the, what are the crops? That can also be a very important, uh, can, can be very important data about this entity. Is this clear? What is meant by an entity? What is meant by, by collecting data about these, about these entities? Yes? Okay. Next, yes, so this is from data collection to database. You collected this data, but of course, if you have it, have it only in an analog way, you have to digitize it. I mentioned it before. But you will also have to structure it, yeah, because in the end, we want to retrieve information from this data. So in order to do this in an efficient way, you will have to structure your data. And often, tables are used to structure, to structure data. And why is the structuring needed? I already mentioned it. You must do it on an efficient way, in an efficient way. You, this way, by structuring it, you can facilitate search and query of the data. A search meaning that you can just look what data you have. And uh, I'll come back to that in a later session. If you do a query, for example, if I have a data set of all the students who are, who are in my class, uh, so on Kayulokets, I can see this list of names of the students that I can expect in my class. Um, I can ask questions or I can, or I can query this data set by, for example, filtering out all students that have taken a previous GIS course uh, or are in this, in this agricultural um, course. For example, that's performing a query. Uh, you're filtering your data set in order to retrieve uh, answers or to provide answers. Tables. It's not really strange why we use tables. Other, also, other software will, will be using uh, tables. There is a follow-up session, uh, not session, a, a follow-up course, only uh, addressing this database part. So if you're interested, you can, you can uh, still learn more about this. Uh, but here it's important that we use tables. Also, if you will be using QGIS, this QGIS software, you will find this information in, in a table format. Yes, so. We have data. We have collected data about these entities, stored it, and structured it in a database. The next step is actually the ultimate goal of an information system: is providing information, uh, meaning providing answers on different questions. For example, what, uh, when, or what if? Uh, when did you subscribe for this course? Uh, that's an, that's a question that that I that I could ask. What if? What would happen? If I, um, for example, if, if it's a, in a landscape uh, um, context, what would happen if I deforest this patch? Yeah? What would happen to the flooding of a certain, or the flooding uh, potential or the flooding risk at, at a certain location? Yeah? These are what if questions, very interesting, because this way you can, you can compute the, the, the impacts of a certain scenario. Yeah? So, need very useful information. This. Still, I'm not talking about geographic information systems only. This is valid for all information systems. I think about your ba bank account. They can also compute scenarios like what would happen if we increase the, the Disconto uh, factor. I think it's a factor. I'm not sure. Uh, so these question types are still there. Anybody already have an idea? What kind of question will be important in a GIS context? When we add not only data about, uh, or when we when we store data about geospatial entities, meaning that we have data about their location and their shape. Do you think it's one of these three? Yeah. Where and what's your? Okay, you're both right. Indeed, where will be one of the most important uh, questions that you can solve with the GIS, with the geographic information system. And where are my agricultural parcels cropped with, uh, with corn, for example? And these questions will be very important if we have this geospatial characteristics also stored in our database. So an information system, let me repeat, is 
in fact nothing more than a database equipped with tools and these tools will help you to formulate answers uh, on certain questions and of course if you know which question you will ask you will also know which data that you will collect uh, again the objective is very important when you start collecting data you al already need to take into account which um, questions that you will answer uh, did you already hear about metadata what is metadata in fact metadata there is this word meta in it so it's data about the data uh, so it's it gives you an idea of the objective why was this data collected and other characteristics which can be important who is the owner uh, do i have to pay if you if i want to use this data and, um, what is the reference system we will come back to that in the next session uh, for which goal was it was it created how were the data collected and that will give you the ability to check whether this data is useful for you for your purpose for your questions that you want to answer uh, it will it will give you the ability to evaluate this okay. so here again data collection is important to keep this objective in mind and if you will use other data uh, for example you will digitize other data or you will just import it in your database check the metadata it's very very important so i was here information is also i i, I mentioned this before it's structured and interpreted data fit for a specific use specific read for a specific objective uh, use objective or another way to look at information it's data put in its context to allow for interpretation uh, so you will also be help uh, well that's one way why you have to structure your data but also here this is what what information is uh, this can give you more information or an answer to a specific question there are different tools or, or functions that you can use uh, if we come back here uh, yeah, these computing functions can be a query, can be a filtering of, of a data set or spatial analysis and that you can make some overlaps between different layers. For example, if I'm interested in, in tracking uh, wild boar accidents, I can use different data sets. I can use a, a data set of all, the, of all of the road infrastructure, of all the forest patches, of, of the known locations where wild boars can be present. I can make an overlap of this and these spots, these crosses, these crossroads can give me an idea of these are the potential locations where this wild boar accident can, can be expected. Uh, so these are also types of, of computations or spatial analysis that will help you uh, find the answer on your question. Uh, so computing fu functions, other functions can just be uh, viewing or mapping functions so that you can just create maps, make uh, make maps that you can take with you in the in the in the field can also be a way of of representing inform information. Again, some some more examples of of typical questions, not about geographic information systems uh, per se, but other other uh, entities as well. Uh, persons, you can ask questions: How old is a person? What would happen, for example, to the amount of of voters if we uh, decrease the age where you can vote and now it's 18 if we decrease it to 16 what would happen uh, what if uh, so how many extra voters will we have and so on uh, which parcels are un unbuilt which are built up and and so on i think this is very clear uh, which questions you can ask about which which entity but no entity we still refer to crisp objects again you already you already stated this and with a geographic information system if we make if we if we make the step from a, a typical a general information system to a geographic information system this where question will be one of the most important questions or one or, or the of the most oftenly asked questions to our to our data set when we talk about geographic information systems we have data about geospatial entities so we add this term geospatial geospatial referring to the fact that we have information about the location and the shape G typical geospatial entities are rivers hydrography spatial destination zones uh, which zones are designated for a certain land use can represent the world as we want it to be and this is how it's how it should be of course this can can be different as from the world as it is uh, this is where we want our, our housing to be present or this is what we want to keep for for an agricultural land use 
of course, reality will, will not be um, overlapping perfectly. Municipalities, uh, buildings, properties, uh, and so on. These are all geospatial entities. And you can see that this where question will be an important question here. Um, some more examples of geospatial entities. I will not go over all of them. You can just read them. I think it's clear what a geospatial entity is. If it's not clear, shout uh, or send a, send a, a message. Uh, but I think if 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 you know the concept for for regular entities, you will also know it for geospatial entities. Eh? You can use it for cadastral applications, for example, patrimonium, all properties of Keuleuve. You can ask different questions, uh, which buildings of, of uh, Keuleuve are located in the city of Antwerp, for example. You can you can uh, ask questions and answer questions. Uh, related to spatial planning, these are maybe um, more relevant for you. Transport infrastructures, uh, there are different kind of entities, uh, railways, uh, waterways, rivers, and so on, these spatial destination zones versus zones effectively occupied by a land use type. Uh, this is the world as it is. This is probably the world as we want it to be. And just to make this, this clear. To security, you see that there are numerous examples of, of geospatial entities. Uh, that's why I think such a GIS course is, is relevant or interesting for multiple uh, disciplines. It can be from security policy, there, also, there can also be students from the Masters of Logistics and Traffics following this course. Maybe they're here, or uh, oh, okay, blah. or maybe they're following it the live stream. So also there, this ability to ask geospatial or to retrieve geospatial information is is very important. They're related to the management of the natural and the cultural resources. Uh, for example, the UNESCO World Heritage is also an entity, and we can store this in our in our database. Uh, agricultural policies, other issues, still it's also it's also possible. Questions that you can ask, I think, or I suggest you to read this as well. Maybe I will pick out uh, a few. Uh, where are the agricultural parcels that contribute most to the nitrate pollution of surface waters? You will need information about my agricultural parcels, also about your your rivers. Where are your rivers? So you can compute distances between your surface water and your agricultural parcel. Also your topography, your elevation will be important so, because you can imagine if there is a steep slope uh, that, that surface water, often um, polluted surface water or, or uh, water in a, in a eutroph uh, state can flow to the river. So elevation is important. Um, soil texture will also be important. Your soil uh, uh, characteristics so again, to answer these questions, you will need different data sets. And together, different data sets will uh, constitute uh, a database. So again, for the other questions, ju just read it to have an idea what kind of questions you can answer. Maybe if I make this break, or before I start here, I will have a 10-minute break. Or Okay, are we ready to start again? I also adapted the presentation characteristics, so maybe the students who had a black screen on their live stream might be able to see it now. I'm, I'm not sure. <coughs> but anyway, and we will, we will uh, continue. This is also a very important slide. Here we will make the step between reality and this database. So if we talk about reality, we talk about entities being present in this reality. If we translate this entity, or if we model it, we will make some kind of abstraction and model it into a database, then we talk about objects. So in fact, an entity in reality becomes an object in a database. And this is a very important terminology. An entity is different from an object Feature can be used as a synonym, as a synonym for synonym for both entities and objects. Uh, this is one of the exam questions that I asked uh, last year. Uh, what's the difference between an entity, an object, and and the feature? And do they represent the same or not? And then you have to say no, they don't represent the same. An entity occurs in reality 
if we translate this or if we transform it, if we create an abstract model of this entity and store it in a database, we are referring to a geospatial object, uh, not an entity. This object, uh, together with an entity, has a location. Uh, because it's geospatial, we, we know its location and its, uh, its shape. Uh, I already referred to that. That needs to be there. What can also be interesting are certain characteristics, are certain attributes, we'll call it. Attributes, for example, if we have a, an object in our database representing a house in reality, in interesting attributes can be the owner of this house, uh, the date that it was constructed, the date that it was renovated, the area that it, that it covers, and so on. And its behavior can also be interesting. Is it uh, a static object or is it a, dyna a dynamic object? Can the location change? What do we need to take into account? If we want to define its shape, then most common shapes are either point-based, yeah. then we'll talk about a vectorial data model. Uh, what is point-based? It can be a point, it can be a line, a line being a sequence of points, or a polygon, an area, meaning that it's also a combination of lines or points, in fact, because a line is a combination of points. It's a combination of points where the start point is the same as the end point. And then we talk about, about the polygon or, or an area or a vol volume if we are thinking in, in 3D, in the third dimension. That's for the vectorial data model, it's point-based. Yeah. Another way to represent data is by using cells or pixels or rasters. Yeah. In this case, we will be using, for example, all squares uh, to represent something in reality. I will come back to this, to this later, but that's how we can define the shape. Of course, you know, if you if you will use cells or pixels, you will all have have a, have a combination of of, uh, of squares, for example. Whereas if you use a point or or an area, you can also map irregular um, shapes yeah, because your your polygon can can be a circle or can be something very with a very irregular shape. That's the difference. But that will be the topic of the first session next week. And this will be about this data model, this vectorial data model and a raster data model. Uh, object of the same uh, shape, which, ha which have a similar shape and a similar list of characteristics or attributes can belong to one object class. Uh, for example, cadastral parcels, street, access, traffic lights. And similarly, if we talk about reality, similar entities can also be stored or can also be classified into entity classes. And one object class is stored in one object-oriented geodata set. So, for example, you can have a data set containing all information about agricultural parcels. Uh, one agricultural parcel is one object. If you have multiple, you'll have multiple object or an object class of this agricultural parcel, and this can be stored in a, ge in a geodata set. Uh, so one geodata set will contain information about one object class. Uh, if we combine multiple data sets, Think about the problem that I, the, the example that I gave you with these wild boar cra crossings. You have one data set of your traffic infrastructure, of your road infrastructure, one data set of your forest patches, and so on. So that's a database. It's a combination or a collection of geo data sets. What is still important, so we talked about shape. Also location is very important. And for entities, you can store this information or get this information either through an implicit geospatial uh, system. Yeah. If you refer to a house, it can, you can represent its location by the address. Yeah. In that case, it's implicit. If it's, if it's made explicit, you will have this numeric coordinates yeah, compared to a certain reference. And that will be the topic of the session in two weeks. We will talk about reference systems. Yeah, for example, if you measure something through a GPS device, you will have your location compared to a reference ellipsoid, which is in that case WGS84. And maybe you already heard of it. It's some kind of simplification, some kind of, of representation of the Earth, of the globe, and you will put or, or, or map your location compared to... Actually, you will define your location compared to this reference, to this geographic reference system. And then you, you will obtain numeric coordinates, geographic coordinates, and these will be explicitly geospatial, because you can see 
coordinate yourself. If it's an address, you will have to to uh, um, proceed with one more step, at, at least one more step to get these uh, explicit uh, coordinates, uh, these numeric coordinates. This is what I already mentioned. Right? If you want to translate your entity and store it into an object into a database, it will require abstraction and modeling. Abstraction, of course, always keep in mind you will simplify reality. You will do this based on one or more objectives that will define the abstraction criteria that you will use and also the shape and the characteristics of your element that you want to describe will be necessary in order to know which model you will use, uh, whether you will use a point, a line, an area, or, or a raster-based uh, or a pixel-based uh, representation. Uh, for example, a point can be used to, to map a building if you're only interested in, in knowing the location of these buildings or if you only want to know how many buildings are present in, in, a, in a certain municipality. But of course, of course, if you want to know information about the roof area in a certain neighborhood, uh, for example, if you want to know the potential for installing green roofs in a city, you, will, you want to know how many flat roofs there are, then you will need to store these buildings not as points, because then you will not have this information, you cannot compute it, but as areas. Uh, so you can really compute the area or, or the roof, uh, rooftop area. Lines are typically used for rivers, for example. Let's come back to this, uh, to this slide. Which entities can you, can you distinguish here? Can you see? Again, I think it's, it's very clear. Anyone want to try it? Which entities are there and which are, are useful data about these entities that you can store as objects? For example, if you want to represent it by an area, it can be a certain um, municipality or a certain district in this municipality. Uh, for example, in this case, it's the Bebtov. Useful data to collect are, for example, the number of inhabitants. And very important is that you will have this unique ID for every object. Uh, so every object has a unique ID. For example, if you want to, or why is this, is this useful? If you want to combine different data sets or perform spatial analysis on it, you can always uh, come back to the, to the initial data set. Or if you want to join multiple tables, link multiple tables to each other, it can also be done based on, for example, the ID. If it's, if it's a unique feature that or, or um, characteristic that you want to um, join it. Uh, but you can also use, for example, this name, the Beemtov, to join different tables based on it. So this is a district, can be, can be modeled through an area, through a polygon, because you can see that there are some irregular shapes in here, uh, some irregular uh, um, boundaries, but still it has a crisp boundary. Uh, you can say here this district uh, stops. Uh, that's what this boundary represents. Other uh, entities, for example, these rivers, you can represent them by lines if you're only interested in knowing where the river where, where the river goes. Of course, if you want to uh, map the amount of, of uh, river verges that you have, you can select another type of shape. You can also model it through areas because you will have this information about the area that the verge uh, comprises. And so river name is an important uh, data characteristic. You can also uh, have um, discharge rates, uh, the amount of water that flows through a certain point, uh, nutrient concentrations and nitrate, phosphate con concentrations can also be useful attributes, useful descriptive elements describing the state of, of uh, my object. In this case, buildings can also be represented by, for example, points uh, here, represented by stars, but in fact you can use points to do that and useful information, date of construction, and so on. So if I have this table of all my buildings, I can, by performing a query, I can ask my database which buildings were constructed after 2015, for example, and get the information. This is clear, right? Let's come back, because previously I said that I was not complete, and here we are. Real world is more than a collection of geospatial entities. Which 
elements do you think that are missing here? Or let me rephrase it. Can you descri describe every element of the real world by a crisp object, by something that has clear boundaries? You already know the answer, it's no, yeah, because there is this plus question mark, question mark. What characteristics, uh, what elements, you can check this, this map can already tell you something or, or, or other ideas, yes? Elevation, indeed, it's nothing that stops, uh, yeah, that has clear, clear boundaries, uh, nothing that, it's more like, like a continuum. Yeah, you can see that elevation is present throughout this, this image. Yeah, it's actually a canvas on which the entities occur. Yeah, elevation is a good example, anyone else? Now, what do you mean by geography? Uh, you need to be more uh, specific, I think. Elevation can be part of the terrain around it, so, so that's true. But other uh, variables or other elements? If you refer to geography, maybe you refer to soil as well. Uh, soil texture, soil groundwater depth are also not uh, elements that, that stop somewhere. They are a continuum. If you think about climate characteristics, uh, the air temperature is also something that is present everywhere. It's present as a, as a continuum in which the all other uh, entities occur. Uh, so elevation, the depth of lakes, uh, very, very similar, or the groundwater depth. Meteorological conditions, air temperature, air pressure is also something that changes, or air pollution, air quality, uh, your, your uh, amount of fine dust in the air can also hardly be be mapped by, by uh, polygons or by points or lines, but they will occur throughout your, your, um, your canvas. Uh, so because these, they are continuous, they cannot be represented by crisp objects. I think that's clear. So in fact, if you look at reality, it's more than an entity, it's an entity and a terrain characteristics. Uh, so if we come back to this, slide that we have data stored in our database about geospatial entities but also about terrain characteristics uh, these are mentioned in italics for example elevation uh, bathymetry if you look at, at ocean levels for example meteo meteorological conditions are also very important but still the main question that you will ask is where uh, where are my zones that are very prone to flooding for example then you will need information about elevation about this terrain characteristic. Okay, clear so far? Entities and terrain characteristics are very important concepts here. I already mentioned this, I think. So in order to be geospatial, uh, data must encompass the geometric component, and you must have information about the position, about the location and the shape, either in 2D or 3D, that doesn't matter, it's always present. Uh, this descriptive component, the attribute, the data about your about your object, for example, the date of construction, um, the uh, number of inhabitants, and so on, can be present. Uh, they don't need to be present, but of course, depending on your on the information that you want to retrieve, they you you will be happy if they are present. Uh, they 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 should be present. Time, I mentioned before. If we have an image, if we have a data set, if we collect the data set, it's not only about images, but also other data, s data sources. You will collect data, you will go out in the field with your GPS measurement, you will perform, um, uh, or you will ask people their opinion, it's also something static. And you can also com relate it to, your, to, their, to their location, but still the amount or the data that you collected represents a state at a specific time. So time can be a third comp component, and can give you the information and give you well the ability to evaluate whether the data that you collected can still be used or not uh, whether you need to be careful because they're outdated especially if you want to uh, have information on the di on a dynamic uh, object so time is a third object component this will most likely not be present uh, often this is neglected this is this information is not stored this must be present this geometric component descriptive component can be present and, and should be present, in fact, uh, depending on the question that you want to answer. And this time factor 
should also be there, but is uh, not often often present. So these entities and the, these terrain characteristics, you should know their their shape and their location. And in order to map that, you will need some kind of geometric primitive. Geometric primitive, I already explained it to you. You can map your shape based on a point-based um, data model, and so a vectorial mod data model. This corresponds to a vectorial data model, and a cell can be your geome geometric primitive. In fact, the definition is given here. It's the most elementary element of your uh, component describing the shape. Right? If you want to use a line, is a sequence of points. Right? So a point is the geometric primitive. Right? There's nothing smaller than a point in this case. Or a cell, if it's raster-based, you will fill a tessellated space filled with, with uh, cells. Right? So in this case, I already mentioned this to you, points, Multiple points are lines, multiple lines can form polygons, and multiple polygons can form volumes. Right? Important to know here, I, I made this graph indeed. When you use points, right, you will have a vectorial data model. You start from an empty Euclidean space. Right? This is a Euclidean space, you have an x-axis x and a y-axis. It's empty and you can store your, your, your objects by adding points, lines, and areas in this empty space. Yeah? Whereas, if it's a raster data model, the difference here is this space is already filled with your cells, with your rasters. Yeah? So you will not start from an empty uh, uh, 2D space, but with a filled 2D tessellated or gridded space. Yeah? That's the difference. Here you will have these pixels because, um, well, a drawback of this is that there cannot be any empty cells. Uh, they will all be filled. You will have to, if there is no data, for example, if you want to map a house by a point, in this case, by a vectorial mod data model, you just add the point, store this information in your database, and that's it. Here, you will say that this cell, for example, is a point, and the other cells, you will have to define them individually and saying this does not, is not a point, is not a house, for example, sorry. It's not how. So here, all this information needs to be stored, which also means that to store this data, you will need more memory. If you want to perform um, computations, you will also need to have a higher computational capacity right? because the data that you, you store is, is higher. Um, well, what did I say? The data that you store is higher? That's not correct. Uh, the, the memory of the data that you store is higher. You need more memory, so also if you want to manipulate and, and compute with this data, you will need more space, more computational capacity. Whereas here you only have this one point, because by you assume that all that is, that is empty in your, in your 2D space represents nothing. Yeah? That's the difference between this. And that's what I will come back to in the next session. It will be about data models, it will be about comparing vectorial data models and um, these raster-based models. Already one, one question for you. I said I, I mainly focused on the disadvantages here. Right? This will, it will require more uh, memory storage, more computational capacity. But what are the advantages of this approach, of this raster-based approach, of this raster data model? For which kind of elements in reality, will you be using this uh, pixel-based or this raster data model? Yes? Terrain characteristics, indeed. Because they are continuously present throughout your uh, surface or, or in reality. And so also in your database, you will not have any empty cell uh, because every cell will have an elevation, will have a certain elevation, will have a certain air quality, will have a certain air temperature. So for these terrain characteristics, we will choose the, the cells as primitives. So we will use our raster data model. Whereas for clearly defined crisp objects, it will be useful to um, map them or to develop them using a vectorial data model. And so in fact, um, uh, let me, no, I will, I will come back to it later. And so this 
remember that this is for, for uh, terrain characteristics. And so we'll be talking about digital terrain models if we use such an approach. This is how you can structure your, your geographic information, your, your um, information on, or your data on the, the location and, and the shape of, uh, of entities using this factorial approach. For example, you can represent your entities by points, lines, or polygons, and you can store this again in tables. And remember, if we structure data, we will be using tables. You can create two tables, for example, one containing the lines, and we'll, we'll um, make this arc coordinate list, uh, arc referring to lines. So you have line number one consists of these coordinates, uh, these points. Uh, line one, for example, where is it? It's here, contains point number five, three, five, five, and eight, five. Uh, that's what, how we can define line number one. Line number two, and so on. You just create a table, very important, it's a table, containing all these um, lines and their, their coordinates. And next, when you want to describe polygons, I already mentioned this to you, polygons, you can define it by a combination of lines. Uh, so you can just store polygon two is uh, defined by lines. So this is polygon two. I can also uh, show it here for the ones who are not following it live. Um, this is polygon two. It consists or of line number four, six, seven, ten, and uh, line number eight. This is how you can define um, polygon number two. Yeah. And if you would, would then look up their, their coordinates, you will see that their start coordinate of line number four, which is uh, 18 um, and one, and the end coordinates will be the same. A start and end point are the same for a polygon. That's how you will define a polygon needs to be a closed loop. And so that's the way how you can structure this information about the shape in tables. And remember, we use tables to do that. Another way of look of structuring data, it's, it's, a, it's again, it's, it's, it's uh, still the same based on this geometric primitive. And you can refer to a point as a zero simplex. A line is a combination of points. It's a, it's a one simplex. An area is a two simplex, you can see it's a combination also of points, start and end point are the same. And a volume, you can also refer to it as a three simplex. Uh, so that's another way of looking at it, and, uh, and for cells as well. And you can also go into 3D, and then we talk about, about voxels. Other ways to structure uh, point primitives, uh, for example, think about um, you going out in the field with your GPS device, you will record data about the elevation at certain points. Uh, so you only have point measurements and you want to store this information or you want to map, for example, a terrain characteristic by it. Uh, so you want to, you're interested, you're measuring elevation in points, but you want to store it as, as something that is, that is um, covering a wider territory. You can do this, do this for example, by this TIN, that is a uh, triangular irregular uh, network. And you will combine your points by triangles. And for example, if you're interested in knowing the elevation somewhere here in the middle of, uh, of this triangle, you can use the distance between your point, that your point of interest, where you're interested in knowing where you want to know the elevation, and your actual field measurements, uh, so the, uh, your points, uh, the angles of your, of your uh, triangle, and use this distance as a kind of weight uh, vector, or a weight vector. Um, because you can assume that the closer you are to a point where you measured, the more reliable this estimate will be, or the more information this point will have in their neighborhood. Uh, so if you, if you want to know the location of this uh, on this spot, you will, well, this point will give you more information because you're closer, but you can also benefit from knowing the location here and here. Uh, so you can use these three estimates to come to one uh, or to interpolate your, your results. And so there you can store it in a tin, in a triangular irregular network, or you can create a raster from it. Uh, for example, you start with this tessellated space with these pixels being present in, in your space, and you can compute the average value of all points that fall within one pixel. 
And that's what you can do by storing it here. Uh, so again, triangular irregular network is factorial based. You will work, work with, uh, with um, areas or polygons. Here you will work with cells, so this is a raster data model. But also here you can translate this into something more smoother by taking the average of each uh, or, or, or by two uh, cells um, lying next to each other. And then you will get this smoother surface, what we refer to as surface. That's all about structuring these primitives into something that's, that will tell you more. Eh? Either it's a tin or it's a, it's a raster. It will give you information of, of this terrain characteristic at other locations. Another important uh, part, in JS, we, we not only talk about 3D objects, but also about 2.5D objects, so 2.5 dimension, which means that it's a single valued surface, or there is one Z value for each coordinate pair, for each X, Y location. I think about elevation, there is only one elevation present at a certain uh, location. There's only one air quality valid or, or present can be measured at one location. So you have only one value, one Z value, one terrain characteristic value at a certain location, whereas in 3D it is possible, it is an option that you have multiple Zs and multiple values for one location. With in fact, if we talk about this terrain characteristic, it's not the case. So we don't refer to terrain characteristic, to elevation as a 3D um, model or a 3D object, but rather as a 2.5D surface. Okay? I think this is clear, right? If it's not clear, uh, stop me. Okay, that's how you can structure your geographic data in a database. Uh, so it needs to be structured. Think about these tables. And if you want to interpret it, you can ask questions to your, to your data set. And you can use these computing functions uh, to retrieve these answers. And of course, it's very important to know your unit of measurements when you, when you solve questions. Uh, elevation, you can express it in, in meters noise intensity and, data and decibels and so on. I think it's very um, useful. And of course, if you want to retrieve answers, it can be possible that you need more than one uh, data set as an input and try to combine it. Okay, I already mentioned this. Uh, you must have information about this, this geometry and because it, it's geospatial information. A geo is central, geo. You need to know its location on Earth. Most commonly, you also have these characteristics and characteristics, Characteristics, if you want to use the right terminology, we refer to it as attributes. Uh, also, when you will be doing the assignments and, and the, the, the exercises, you will often look for information in the attribute table, right? structured way of, uh, of representing these, these attribute, these attribute uh, data. And optionally, I already mentioned this to you, temporal validity of this geometry. This can change, but also their characteristics, also the attributes can change. They can change. Imagine if you store information about the number of, of inhabitants, this can increase or, de uh, increase or, or decrease. The, if you sell a house or if you sell an agricultural parcel, the date of, of um, or, or the owner can change, for example, or if you store this date on, on um, when it was sold for the last, time, uh, the last time, this can also change. So let's come back to uh, geographic information system. Uh, we'll come back to this technology later. It's a system, geographic information system. That's the ac that's uh, uh, therefore it is the acronym uh, GIS. It's a geospatial database equipped with these tools, uh, these tools which allow you to to uh, find answers. This is what I told you in the beginning. If you have errors in your input data, also your answers will contain errors. Yeah, so rubbish in, rubbish out. Be aware of this. So also in your data collection, if you collect the data for a certain use and you want to use it to answer questions for, with a different objective, it can be that even your data are, are, are perfect, uh, that, they are, that they do not contain mistakes, but still your answers will not be satisfying you. So be aware that if you don't add 
the right input data, either it's correct or it's, it's, it's a bit biased, your answer will also be either not right or, or biased. So geographic information systems, it's an extension of these more general non-geographic information systems, such as the KU-Loket, Toledo, for example. It's also built on a database and you want to manipulate it to get your answers. This is a nice summary of this course, in fact. Uh, emphasis on this geometric com component, so the where question is a very important question, is key here. Uh, so different questions you can, you can try to solve. What is, as, what is at a given location? Where can I find forests? Where can I find the buildings of, uh, owned by Keo Leuven, um, owned by this, this person? Or, or where are the zones that, that are very prone to flooding? Uh, or where are the are my water bodies that will be um, uh, that have a high probability to become uh, eutroph um, and so on? Uh, what has changed since this will? If you want to know this, it's important that you also have this time information in your in your database. Which spatial spatial patterns occur? Also very important if you want to look at the, at the landscape at a, at a more uh, at a higher level. So this to make clear that G GIS is a geographic information system. When I started this lecture, or the title of this lecture was that it's also a technology. And technology, what do we mean with that? With with that, well, it allows you to build databases and exploit it. Uh, ask questions. So one of the questions I also ask, asked uh, last year was GIS is an information system and a technology. Do you agree? And, and, and um, what can you tell me about this? And it wasn't uh, phrased that fake, but I don't want to give you all the details. Uh, but know that GIS is more than an information system. It's also a technology. Uh, again, this is a very similar figure that we already saw. Eh? We start from the real wor world, from the reality, and we'll simplify it, we'll make abstraction of it, eh? taking our objectives into account, and store this information about entities, about terrain characteristics in a database. And this way, um, by designing a database, we also refer to, as, refer to it as geospatial data modeling, and we'll try to to use our models, uh, either the vectorial data model or the raster data model, to make abstraction of the real world, store it in our database, and afterwards we will use our, our software software tools. And so this step is building a geo database. In this step, we're also exploiting databases. Uh, we're we're doing management. Uh, we 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 want to keep our data set up to date. We want to transform it. For example, if you have data collected by a GPS, I already mentioned the ellipsoid that you use or the reference system that you use is this kind of ellipsoid WGS84. If you collect data using a different source or, or, or uh, it can be present in a different coordinate reference system, you will also need to be able to transform data. Uh, you can also use these kind of other functions mentioned in the previous uh, slides using to map query or, or to visualize your data. and. You also have your computing systems, so GIS is also a toolbox containing these spatial analysis tools you can use to retrieve your answers. And so it's a set of different uh, tools, either also to, to convert your data from an analog form to, to a digitized format. You also have these tools present to structure it, to transform it, to query it, and I think I already mentioned it, or to um, communicate this new information. If you want to communicate, if you if you created a plan of the world as you want it to be, uh, you created this plan, you can make a map, you can print it, you can export it from, from your GIS uh, software and use this for communication. Uh, because um, in my experience, if you want to talk to stakeholders and try to convince them of your plan, of the vision that you created for this study area, it's best to do it with a, with a, with a map. Uh, you can make drawings on it and so on. It's, that's, that's a very useful or a powerful communication tool. And so this lends or, or this borrows a, lo a lot of uh, um, technologies from this database technology. Okay, this is already the last slide. Are there questions so far? Did I go too fast? 
because I can see I still have a lot of time. It's not a, a disadvantage, I think, maybe. So to summarize this first session, as spatial planners, as GIS specialists uh, that you will become, we are interested in knowing the state of the world as it is, as it was, right? also what is causing these, these, uh, these changes between what it was and what it is. The world as we expect it to be, uh, as, it, as it is uh, planned to be, under a certain uh, scenario or under a business as usual scenario, and the world as we want it to be. And we want to minimize this difference. And that's what we will be doing as spatial planners. We have different tools or different data sources. Uh, we can represent this state by either maps, in a more traditional way, or this database database which will allow us to to perform analysis uh, so in GIS we are we're interested in storing this information structuring this information in into databases in this database or in the data set can encompass uh, data about geospatial entities terrain characteristics entities crisp boundaries can um, it has clear boundaries terrain characteristics is the continuum the canvas on which these entities occur. The information or the data that we store about these objects, I think, about entities in the real world become an object in a database, will contain information about geometric component, location, shape, descriptive component, attributes, uh, that's what we call attributes, and a temporal component if it's if it's present. Eh, because we look at something dynamic. I cannot stress this enough. Reality is something dynamic. We can only have a snapshot. Eh? either in the 2D or 3D space, it can be Euclidean space or a tessellated space, Euclidean space will refer to the vectorial data model, tessellated space to the raster data model, and then on this exam, if you answer this, you can have a lot of, you can earn a lot of points. So GIS is an information system. You can r find or, or answer typical questions starting with where, right, but also other questions, so what if, for example, or, or where is the optimal location if I want to extend uh, or if I want to build a new company, where can I do this? And so also these questions are there based on a database that you want to exploit. Right? And how do I exploit this database? How do I build this database? That's because GIS is also a technology. Right? You can define your data models, factorial raster data models, create this database with these data models, uh, fill your database, and afterwards, as a last step, exploit it, manage this database, and retrieve the information. Okay. Questions so far? Yes? Um, no, because the practical, well, let me repeat the question. So is the, is the question also on, on a, or is the exam also taking place on a computer? No, because we will evaluate the practical part based on these three assignments. Uh, so that will account for one credit. And depending on in which course you are, you will have either two um, or three other theoretical OLAs. So the students in the I0N 6 to B will have two theoretical questions. Uh, so from this, one of this OLA on spatial data modeling and GIS, uh, and GIS, sorry, and the other one on, on the uh, functionality of geospatial, of, of GIS. And students in either the ION 6 to A or G0 P 10 A will also receive two questions from me and one question from my colleague Lise Jacobs about uh, error propagation or ter and, and terrain models uh, and so on. So the, there, is n there will not be a part on, on, uh, uh, on this. On this of course, you will need this information that you learn and the skills that you learn through your assignments to also uh, get all the questions. Uh, for example, I can, get, I can give you one question that you're, that you're working for the city of Leuven and that you get the, or you are asked to create uh, a plan of all of uh, of all the bicycle lots and and and, and all the the bicycle infrastructure, and I will let you think about which data that you need and how would you tackle this problem. So you will not perform any analysis on a computer, but you will just write it down, or in fact you will not write it down because this exam will also be um, online, because you might have heard that 
in January, we will we also have to um, well keep a lot of students away from the campus because we cannot uh, uh, well not everybody can well the capacity is is exceeded. Let me phrase it like that. So in this course, the assignments will be evaluated based on or the practical session will be evaluated based on assignments, and the theoretical OLA. This is only valid for you because the ones that will will join later have to go to come to the campus. But you and the ones, of course, who are following the live streams, they will uh, make this exam online. We will still figure out how it works, um, but it can it will it will probably be an exam with a limited uh, amount of time. And you will just see. A number, of, a number of questions on your screen and you will have to type it. Well, it can be open questions, can be multiple choice questions, uh, can be true false questions that you will need to argument why it's true or why, why it's false, but it will be online. Was that a, an answer to your question? Okay, so you will need a computer to answer the questions indeed, but not using uh, any uh, QJS tool. Okay, other questions from the live stream public? Nothing. Okay, I will be be here for uh, well, ten more minutes or or fifty more minutes. So if you have a question, you can always come up front. I will also check this poll everywhere in case there are, are more questions. So uh, I will not see you physically next week. I will see you probably if you have questions in the collaborate session. Okay. Thank you and take uh, take care.